power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Everybody have one of these? Open it up real quick. Quick tour. Here's the one minute tour. You guys, you can stay if you'd like. We'd love to have you sing some more. You don't have to go. Please don't leave. That was good, wasn't it? Amen. It's great to sing praises unto the Lord. It's great to to worship the Lord, and it's great to be at the first day of the week. This is the first day of the week. Not tomorrow. Today is the first day of the week. And we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ every Sunday. So praise the Lord. And you sound like you, uh, you're ready to do that. You already are in the middle of doing that. So praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, the three in one. Did you teach on that this morning there, Dr. Bonner? Amen. Okay. I, I, he just, I just woke him up there. He was doing all right. Amen. We're going to be in Matthew 5 in a minute, but you need this little handout for a moment so that I can just run you through a few things and... Um, just kind of get you ready to go. Look on the walls. You see some banners up. You look in the uh, lobby and fellowship hall. We've got some banners up and we're ready to go as God is looking for the uncommon person who is the faithful person. Our theme verse, and you can, you can see it up on one of the banners underneath it. It is incorporated into uh, the artwork when you see uncommon. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness but a faithful man who can find. And you would think maybe he has a little bit of a, a negative connotation. Well, uh, it has a positive connotation too. We'll just leave it up to the preachers who are going to be speaking God's word over the next few days, starting next Sunday. Whatever the, the Lord gives them, we'll look forward to that. But next Sunday morning, both in our 9 o'clock service and 1030, Brian Calloway will be preaching here in our uh, main service, and there's a young guy we flew in all the way from another continent, another country, and he brought his bride too, which is very, very important. Why don't you both stand for a moment, Alex and Crystal Chippy, so that we can say hi again, and you will be seeing Alex and Crystal around here for a couple of months, but they are going to be speaking next Sunday morning in the fellowship hall. So we're looking forward to having them with us, and then they're going to be speaking again, and uh, Alex is going to be preaching on Tuesday evening. So Sunday morning, please come. Next Sunday, he's going to share his testimony, and uh, Crystal, if you had a few minutes, you know, you could sneak in there, but it'll be great for both of you to share a testimony of how you came to Christ, how that God put you together, and that'll set things up for the rest of the week. So aren't we glad that they're here? Praise the Lord. Thank you both. And uh, it's going to be really, really just a, uh, every conference has its own God elements to it. And God is putting this one together. God's been putting it together. So we're looking forward to Sunday kicking it off. Just a real quick to kick it off, maybe even just to remind you, Wednesdays, we've been meeting uh, missions on Wednesday. And this Wednesday we're having a prayer, uh, prayer night here right in the auditorium for our missionaries, for our missions conference Please be here this Wednesday to join in a prayer night for our conference and for the upcoming fall into next year as we support new missionaries, consider other missionaries, and you see the list of missionaries there. Sunday night, you have a special treat. Uh, there's a guy we know. Bobby Bonner will be speaking, Dr. Bobby Bonner. We're going to start calling you doctor now all the time. Royal Reverend. <laughs> Supreme. No, we won't get that. But Bobby's going to be preaching next Sunday, and the first part of his message time that he's going to be allowed, we've decided to give him three hours next week, I mean uh, next Sunday evening, so you have a fan, you have some, <laughs> we have one person, that was, <laughs> amen, but he's going to spend a great deal of time, 15, 20 minutes in the front half, speaking of the history of Kafula Futa, speaking of the history of the mission work that has been a hub area, a hub spot, a Antioch type of place that has sent out so many. And that will kind of set some things up for me being able to share with you uh, our special offering that we're going to take up in the month of October. I'll share that with you next Sunday. 
And I'll make sure that all of you that would love to be part of that have a, a, a giving card, a commitment card for 2021 missions as well. And then, of course, after that Sunday, we're not going to, uh, we're just going to accelerate a little bit. Brian and Tammy will be speaking the first few minutes of uh, Monday evening, and then Brian will be preaching the Word of God. They're going to be sharing a little bit of testimony of how they got there and what God's doing as uh, time continues to reveal to them and God reveals to them their next steps in ministry. So that'll be the first part of Monday night. Tuesday night, uh, Alex is going to be preaching, uh, but before he preaches his message, and again, I've given him two, three hours, we're like Zambians, we can, we can stay, right? No problem. This is a Zambian man. He's used to having everybody stay for hours and hours and hours. So Tuesday night, we're not going home, and we'll be here all the way through Wednesday. But Alex and Crystal are going to share 15, 20 minutes. I'm sure they could use many more minutes. But talking about the mission work as related to Kafula Futa, what God has done to put them in that place in mission work and in the ministry, and then it leads into him preaching time on Tuesday evening, and then uh, we got to have Brian back one more time, and Wednesday night, uh, Brian will be preaching the Word of God. We'll have, uh, of course, as you can see right on the back here now, you got your whole schedule, and we're going to have the coffee house cranking next week. Somehow, some way, if I have to be pouring like hot water on top of some crystals or something like some little coffee things, but we're going to have a little reception. Wouldn't that be good? Reception. Uh, every night, 6 o'clock to 7, we'll have the coffee house going. So it'll be a great opportunity for you to come a little bit earlier, have a cup of coffee, and, and, uh, and just enjoy the fellowship and the time together. We'll have some desserts before, and then whatever's left over, it'll be there after our services are over. So looking forward to next week, starting next Sunday. God has been doing a wonderful thing as you're in Matthew chapter number 5, and you join me there in our message uh, God has been doing some neat things in his work. The Bible says, and that is our theme verse for our series, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Keep in mind that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, some would teach that they are the same. Uh, God's word clearly shows us that they are not the same, and when we see that doctrinally and are able to lay it out, it's clear that God is, re they're, they're very closely related. But if you intermingle them when you're speaking of a certain passage, your theology and doctrine can get messed up. But again, Jesus Christ right now is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. He's speaking, as we've been covering the last few weeks, speaking of what the kingdom is going to be looking like and how it is that you can fulfill the kingdom. But since he's showing them how lost they are, He's showing the Jewish audience how that they could never, ever fulfill the righteousness that is being put to them on this Sermon on the Mount. And that he's got the multitudes all gathered around, but he's also got his disciples really close to him. He's telling them, look, if your righteousness doesn't even exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's no way that you'll ever be able to be in the physical kingdom. In fact, what he's dealing with them on is their need, their desperate need for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he has got to get them to a place, as we have say, said many times in our study the last few weeks, and you, many of you have been taught this, that someone who doesn't sense that they're lost, someone who doesn't believe they have a need for Jesus Christ, it's surely going to be a really extra uphill battle to lead them to the Lord, to have them see the scriptures and the righteousness of Christ. So you need to, hey, that person has to get lost before they get saved. And these are the lost sheep of Israel. And there has been a dark time, a quiet time from the Lord from old, for over 400 years. It's been quiet. We haven't heard from God. And then the Lord Jesus Christ is born. And now Jesus Christ is starting his earthly ministry in Galilee and on, and he is truly preaching the truth as he knows it, because he is God. Then we know Sermon on the Mount is this message that Jesus Christ preached that is really recorded again, the longest message that Christ re, uh, preached in the Gospels, and we can see that there is a great deal of reference to righteousness, righteousness, 
righteousness. What is life and the kingdom going to be like one day for you that are born again? This is a little preview, and this is something that we have looked at even in last week in this section of thinking, hey, Jesus has a standard. Doesn't Jesus Christ have a standard? The standard is himself. The standard is him, and in order for you and I to be in a place where we understand how this is even possible to live, we need Jesus Christ. Without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you can't do any of this. Now, real quick preview thought, just, just for a few seconds. You meet people, at least hopefully you're meeting and talking to people, that are in a place where they don't know Christ. And when you hear them talk, yeah, I go to church. Uh, I spend some time uh, reading my Bible a little bit. I've read that Bible before. And they start talking about how they're trying to do right. And they do a lot of right things, and, and they're attempting to live out a righteous life. And I'm not talking about the people that say, hey, I'm just, I just, I know that I'm a pretty good person. There is many a church. In fact, there's many a person that says, hey, Sermon on the Mount, the Golden Rule, that's my life. That's how I live. I mean, I, I don't know how God could ever reject me. I don't have any idea how it's possible that God wouldn't just receive me into heaven. Maybe, possibly. And this morning, I want you to see in the second part of our study on pas the, the passage of Scripture from verse 21 down through 48. We're going to pick it up in verse 43. That Jesus Christ is saying, but I say unto you. But I say unto you. But I say unto you. These first few slides are a reminder of last week's message, and it's the complimentary piece. Again, the second part of being reminded that God put all of this in the scriptures. It is all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, corrections to all scriptures given for profit. And Jesus Christ is saying, this is the way it was said in the old covenant. This is what I say unto you. Again, you and I somehow, some way think that this just somehow walks into your life or walks into our lives by osmosis. Well, last night I fell asleep, and, and I fell asleep with the Bible. I was laying down, and I, I memorized five scriptures while I was sleeping. It was so good. I went to bed. You, you started reading your Bible while going to bed, and that's a good thing. And you fell asleep, and you woke up, and you can't even remember what you read. And that's okay. But if that's the only time you spend in the Bible finding out what Jesus Christ wants you to do and how you want you to live and what your life is like, supposed to be like in him, then you're going to miss this phrase that says, but I say unto you. The religious people of the day said, hey, we've got the Old Testament. We know the Old Covenant. We know what's in there. I understand it. You understand. Hey, why in the world are you teaching us this? What, what, what Jesus? What, what is it? Well, I want to teach you about murder and adultery and, and, dis, and divorce. I want to teach you about oaths and retaliation and love today. That's what we're going to do. But he's teaching them and saying, look, our standard is the Bible, the Word of God. In fact, it's the living Word. It's been raised a couple of notches here because Jesus Christ is preaching it and teaching it. And he's showing them, comparatively speaking, this is what is said, now I say unto you. Let's read the scriptures. Verse number 33, chapter number 5, and let's look at what it is here that Jesus Christ is conveying in this part on the Sermon on the Mount. Verse number 33, again, he says, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Unless you go to some of your uh, hairdressers and you guys use dye, and then you're able to do that. But Jesus is saying in verse 37... When it comes to communication, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Simply, what is he saying? In the Old Testament, it said, hey, verse number one, thou shalt not forswear thyself. 
but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Don't swear. We're not talking about cussing. We're not saying a bad word. The swearing is do not swear an oath that has to substantiate what you've just spoken that should have been truth without you having to swear on a stack of Bibles. I swear on my mother's grave. I swear to you. Why would you have to say that if you're just telling me the truth? Okay? Next one. Pick it up with me. Verse number 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Some of you really like that. <laughs> Retaliation. We're not taking corporal punishment away, but God is saying this is a personal matter right now. For retaliation, what are you supposed to do? Verse 39, here's that phrase. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. How many of you have never heard that? Raise your hand. You've all heard it, haven't you? Right? Okay. Let's go further because Jesus Christ makes sure that he clears everything up and he answers all the thought. And if a man, any man, verse 40, will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Oh, wait a minute, I just had a thought. Verse number 40, that's how lawyers are able to justify taking you to the cleaners. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not being mean. Hey, listen, if I'm in a court case, I want the best lawyer that's going to get me the cloak also. I'm just, but this is a personal thing. This is a personal one thing for you to look at me, to look at it. It's like I look at my personal life. If someone says something to me or does something bad, how do I handle it? Well, if they want something, take, let them take everything. Really? <whistles> this is a rough saying. Verse number 42. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn out thy way away. So, obviously, this is a kingdom of heaven statement. This is in the millennial. This, is not, this doesn't apply to you. You don't have to do it. Don't worry about it. Let's just go back to the way we do things. Really? We'll find out that the church has some instructions that are very closely related. In fact, they're even stronger for you and me as believers in the body of Christ. So, that's our second one. So what have we looked at first? We said, okay, oaths. How do I handle oaths? Secondly, we've looked at retaliation. How do I handle retaliation? Verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemies. This is an Old Testament, clearly, straight up, God has said it. Now, Jesus doesn't contrast it. or He just says, yep, that's it. But let me show you even more than this. This is one where he says, let me raise the bar a little. Verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This isn't talking about love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love thy neighbor as thyself. This is more than that. This is the enemy. This is what do you do with the enemy? This is it's a hard saying. How does he do it? How does he cover it? Verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? For ye salute your brethren only. What do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Boy, that is a great invitation verse at the end. How in the world can I be perfect? I can never be perfect. Do you know that God the Father, when you got saved and you had the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed upon you, and the justification of God came to you by faith 
through the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way through it, that God says, I see you through my son, and he is perfect. And now I see you as my child, perfect. You say, but I'm not perfect on this earth. You're exactly right, because of the house that you have to carry around. But God tells me in the Bible that it's the house of God. This is the house of God. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives in you, believer. That is perfection by God. And the contrary issue is, how could I possibly live perfect when I still have this flesh? Exactly. That's why sanctification comes from the moment of your salvation sanctification to your progressive holiness sanctification. Right? As you day by day walk with the Lord. And then one day the glorification sanctification. Hallelujah. Can't wait to get that. Because then that is where you will be and I will be in Jesus Christ. Not just. Yeah, I think I'm maybe possibly. No. You are a son of God and you will be with the son of God. And you will be in eternity a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is conveying to these religious people who are thinking, well, I'm just going to do a few things really good, and if I do a few things really good, then maybe I can get my way to heaven, and then I can be righteous, and if I'm just righteous enough, then maybe God will be good to me, because I've been good to God. It doesn't work that way. And if you and I would take to heart every single scripture and look at this this way and see, wow, there's great application here to my life, then you realize, wow, this could open up the floodgates for you to talk about anybody about Jesus Christ right now. Because there are people that are walking around wandering aimlessly through life thinking that religious, religious things and just doing good enough and this thing come up and just blows up and everything. I just sure hope that God just, I sure hope that maybe just, I, I just meet, I hope I can meet Peter at the pearly gates and some, this isn't some joke. This is not some game. We use religious little typologies and pictures and illustrations. This is not a game, everybody. I'm just telling you right now, this is about the righteousness of God imputed upon you and in you by Jesus Christ, and then your life reveals righteousness in Jesus Christ, and people look around and you go, you're uncommon, you're uncommon. Why are you so uncommon? In fact, you're a rarity. You're a weirdo. So what? Because I'm a weirdo by just my own personality. Who said... <laughs> Happy anniversary, daughter. <laughs> I'm not giving you guys your present. You <laughs> I know, you got, your pre you, you got your present when you got married, Kathleen. Way over your head. Here's a quick three-minute review. The Old Covenant. Remember. Now remember the, the title real quick back there? Your test is being graded by the master. The master teacher is the one who has done the lesson and he's the one who's going to grade you, going to grade me. And because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ upon you, woohoo, hallelujah, don't need to face that white throne judgment, hallelujah. But we will see the judgment seat of Christ, the bema. And when we see that one, <whistles> did you really live the whole? Did you really walk at all? Did you really live by faith, Mark? Because I put it all there for you. I put the old covenant in and the new covenant in. I sent my son for you. Do not dispel or dis, just disregard what you don't like. Stop using your black Sharpie pen to cancel out verses you don't like. God said, I made it clear in my Bible, in my word, that you are to honor me in this book of the law. We mentioned that verse last week. Joshua 1.8. It should be a verse that all of you memorize to know how to have success. Young people, do you want to be successful? Young people, do you want to be prosperous? Older people, do you want to have success in your end of your life? Then remember, Joshua 1a says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. 
God wrote this old covenant and the new one, but supremely right now looking at this setting for Jesus Christ speaking to the Jews, he wrote the old covenant to remind them that, look, you ought to honor me and stop honoring yourself. Remember we used Psalm 119 last week, great peace have they, which love thy law, and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Is that really true for you and me? Psalm 119, wow, whoo, that's Psalm 119, oh my. How many verses are in there that do not express the word of God as any type of thing? Three? How do you know that? Did that Roger and Barbara Zing take you through that? Amen. Used to be one of my quiz questions at summer camp years ago. Find the three verses that do not speak of the Bible itself and the word in Psalm 119. Wow, that would be a nice one. Because the Bible's teaching me in Psalm 119 about itself. God speaking of his own word that he wrote. It's alive. It's statutes, judgments, precepts, commandments. It's judgment. It's, it's, it's everything that you could possibly want. See, life in his kingdom is something that we oftentimes do not seek. But Jesus Christ says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The old covenant also reminds us that God made it clear that his son was coming to fulfill all the law. Everything pointed to Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament, in the old covenant, pointed to the Jesus that we are seeing right here teaching the Sermon on the Mount. You would think that they would have paid attention. Jesus Christ, is this all we have to do? Is just do a bunch of good things? He's saying, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, why does he just jump right fast forward to that? No, you're going to have to follow me. And it's going to cost you everything to follow me. But I'm getting you ready to be able to witness to anybody if you would just listen to what I'm teaching you from the very beginning that I opened up my mouth in my earthly ministry. Again, you and I think that this just comes. Oh, yeah, just a couple minutes. you got to be in it you got to stay in it, because here's this verse in Psalm 119 that says, Oh, how I love, oh, how love I thy law, exclamation point. Everybody likes to put exclamation points on everything. God puts them just certain places. It is my meditation all the day. Is that my meditation all the day? Psalm 119, verse number 97, we used those last week. So, if Jesus Christ has given this exam, and it's a standardized test, and he's going to grade it, you do know that these grades that you and I get, they're so, so important. Like, all of you that have children, and all of you that have gone to school, some of you, did, did some of you never go to school? I know I act like I never went to school. Right, Bob? Like, did you, what, what school did you go to? Well... I went to Walpole Middle School. Walpole Middle School. This is my eighth grade report card. Back from the 40s, just after the war. <laughs> I had to chisel it. No, I'm just, I'm just. This is my eighth grade year, 1972 to 73. Some of you weren't born, were you? I'm old. For some of you, I'm right on time. So on my report card, I got some B's and some A's. And if you get an A, you're superior. B, it's above average. C, average. D, below average. They still use that stuff? Do they? Yes? So if I get an A, I'm more superior than you? What's wrong with that? Just because you fixed grades over at Blue Springs High School, you better be quiet over there. You're going to get in trouble. This is on, you know, like up on the TV thing. You better watch out. Brown, Cheryl Brown. There she is. But they have another thing. This is crazy. That, some of you remember this. I don't know how they do report cards now. They had this thing over here, citizenship. And I got graded on my citizenship, on my social habits. Got those, right? And then over here, the scholarship, which is your letter grade. And then you got your effort. Mm. <laughs> Quick review. Mathematics, A, A, A. I love math. Oh, I love math.
man. If we had algebra in the eighth grade back then, we were really advanced in Walpole, New Hampshire. <laughs> 2,000 people in that city, I'm telling you. And I lived in North Walpole, New Hampshire, which had uh, eight or 900, big suburb. But in my math, A, 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 I got a two, a three, excuse me, a two, a two, a three, and a three. Effort wasn't very good. Shop class, I got a B, but I got a one for effort. Huh, must have meant I like to be there. Social studies, I got my first B of my life. Excuse me, first C of my life, and I got a B minus. I had an effort of two. Science, I got A's and B, A's and B's, but I got a three for effort. Last thought. At the very top, there's different comments on the back. And none of them are really exciting. Third quarter, I've had a few problems with Mark's attitude this quarter. He had quite a spell where his responses to questions in class were not his best, and besides not trying his hardest, he was being a nuisance to some of the other kids. <laughs> You're not surprised at that, are you, Doc? Come and behold. Aren't you glad that Jesus' grace is so good? So here you go on the effort side. This lays into the next few minutes to finish out our message. Here you go. Fourth quarter. Mark did a fair job on a recent achievement test in algebra. I think he should be able to handle geometry all right, especially if his recent spell of laziness comes to an end and he again tries to do the best work he is capable of. Oh, like none of you ever got that kind of report. <laughs> oh, I'm going to make that disappear. Oh, my gosh. What am I doing? I guess the Lord led me to that illustration. Here we are. Here we are. Simple. The standardized testing of the Lord Jesus Christ is found in the Word. Yes? Every word, every word of it, every jot, every tittle, every word's for you and me. You might get an A, but your effort might be. You might get a C, but your effort's incredible. Because in Jesus, in the word, in the Holy Spirit of God, in conviction, in that consecration and sanctification by his grace and his beautiful mercy on your life, you say, Lord, I want to live for you. I may not have done much, but I always, always want to live for you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been uncommon. So what does Jesus show us when he gives the report card out about our efforts? One, two, three. The next few minutes, just follow along with me. Verse 34 is up on the screen. There's the phrase about, but I say unto you, swear not at all. Neither what? By heaven... For it is God's throne. He's saying, don't swear by Jerusalem. Don't swear by the great city who is the, is the city of the great king. Don't swear by earth because that's where he puts his feet because it's his footstool. Don't swear. Don't say, oh, I swear on my such and suches. I promise you, I swear to you, I'm telling you the truth this time. Where in the world did you and I get to a place where we decided that we should have to swear those kind of words when our life should be filled with the word of God and the truth of the word of God that I wouldn't have to say, no kidding this time, no kidding, I'm telling you the truth. Because he's saying, do not swear at all. Here you go. Here's the report card comment on my card and on our card. We have no need to prove our truth with oaths if our heart is filled with God's truth. You, you get that? You see, this is God's truth. This is God's word. It says in Proverbs 10, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Stop running your mouth about a matter 
that you don't know something about to keep on trying to convince somebody, and I swear to you, I know what I'm talking about. We all get caught up in that, don't we? We start trying to say, oh, I know this, I know this, and then you start backpedaling and telling things and saying, this is what it is, this is what it is, and you have to keep on using more words and trying to swear it through and get it through and get it through. Jesus is saying, no, you don't have to. In fact, it says in Colossians chapter 4, you can put down 1 through 6, I'm highlighting verse number 6, in your notes, Colossians 4, 1 through 6, it says there, what? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. We know that when it comes to salt and light, our answer has to be right. He said earlier in that passage of scripture, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven, what? That we would understand that masters and servants and the way they do things should line up more so with the master in heaven. We continue in pray, prayer, watching the same thanksgiving, with withal, praying also for us. Paul the apostles telling the church that you and I, for you and I, look, Jesus' standard is right here. And you should not be swearing to a matter or swearing by your words, but rather let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And if it's God's truth, it's a slam dunker. That will open up the door to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. His second thing that we talked about earlier, watch this one. Verse number 39, we know what it says. It says in verse number 39, but I say unto you, that ye resist no evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Right? Correct? He's saying, hey, if any man will sue you at the law, let him have the coat, let him have the cloak, let him have everything. If he wants to go with you a mile, let him go two miles with you. Well, that's, again, that's just a kingdom of heaven principle. That's not in the word of God. Well, I'm going to show you here in Romans chapter number 12. If you want to turn there real quick, some of you know that passage. Romans chapter number 12. Around verse number 14, 15, 16, 17. Here's the report card comment off of this one. This class is on how to handle retaliation. The first class was on how to handle my oaths. We have no need to retaliate toward others if our heart is filled with God's assurance. Think about God's assurance in your life. Think about how he has said to you, I have saved you. I have bought you with a price. You are not your own. I've got you. He says in Romans 8, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, right? Things present, things to come. That God is telling us in his word, he's telling you, the church, Hey, church! Clearly, I have got you taken care of in Jesus Christ. You are sealed to the day of redemption. Nothing can separate you and me. Nothing is separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what it says in chapter number 8. But in chapter number 12, it says in what? Verse number 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless it, curse them not. And it goes on down to what? I got it up on the screen for you. Some of you that haven't turned, verse number 17 recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceable with all men. When you have the assurance of the Lord Jesus Christ, assurance of your salvation, then there's not this desire in you to recompense a matter with someone, to retaliate against someone. You and I are told in the Bible to recompense to no man evil for evil. Has anybody ever done anything evil to you? You want to get back at them? The business world tells you it's a dog-eat-dog world. You better get yours before they get you. You're told, hey, make sure you get even. I know people that have said, I don't get even, I get ahead. I just like to be around a person like that. You see, you and I are told by the scriptures to the church, this is how we handle the matter when it comes to retaliation. In the last one, Jesus Christ shows us something very, very powerful. Here you go. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. 
So beyond the retaliation part, I need to do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Oh, my. This is a tough saying. But don't move from Romans chapter number 12. Don't go far from there. Let me even read it before I go to the next slide. Because it says in Romans 12, Dearly beloved, verse number 19, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, that's basic stuff. Well, why is it the church doesn't show that so much that the people are going, how in the world do you handle your enemies like you do? Because you surely have enemies in the business world, or you surely have enemies. And whatever it is, and the person looks at you and goes, man, I cannot believe you handling what you handle and how you handle the things you do from your enemies. Here's the last comment for this particular class. This class is on love. The first class was on oath. The second class was on retaliation. The third was on love. We have no need to hate our enemies with actions if our heart is filled with God's love. God's love is different. God's love is totally different. It says up there, Romans 12, I put it there. If some of you in Romans 12, you can go to your left as I finish. If not, I'll just read it for time. It says in Romans chapter number 5, a verse that you are all pretty much familiar with, and most of you are, but God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Correct? Right? It even says just before that in verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time God, excuse me, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He died for you when you were ungodly. But here's the kicker of all this. Verse number 10 will strike you pretty strong. Write it down in your notes because the whole passage in this area, Romans chapter number 5, verses number 6 through 10, 10 really hits me. For if, when we were enemies, we were enemies. Here's our example. We, we were enemies against God. And while we were enemies, he said, I love you so much. I believe that Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 8, of course, is very powerful. We go into verse number 12 and we see about the first Adam and the second Adam. And we look at all that and we see these things. But we, we forget that verse number 10, sitting right there after the being justified by the blood, it says, we were enemies. You were an enemy before you got saved. We are reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We were enemies, and yet he loved you. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Anybody thankful to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, just say amen. amen. I mean, you were an enemy. And now you are his friend and his son. How is it that we will not express that kind of love for an enemy so that someone would know what Jesus Christ really can do to change their lives? Because we'll be no different than the lost world. No different at all if we don't love others. Like God loved you and me when we were enemies. Before we have the Lord's Supper here, let me just ask you, what does God see in you and me? What does God see in us that looks like Jesus toward other people? Have you and I forgotten what he did when we were enemies? Well, I wasn't an enemy. I was a pretty good person. And then I just asked and prayed. And you don't understand. You were an enemy. And then he saved you. And so the report card on the love lesson is, hey, when you get that love of God in here, woo, 
what a difference. Jesus' report card does include the comments, not just the grades. Please bow for a word of prayer. Lord God, as we go into your beautiful time in the Lord's Supper for the church, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, because when we were enemies, you sent your Son to reconcile us, and your blood, Jesus Christ, was the sufficient and perfect sacrifice to make us justified and perfect before a loving God. Thank you for your righteousness, holy God. Now this morning, we've just spent a little bit of time in your word, and we're just going to spend a little bit more time in worship and communion with you over celebrating the Lord's Supper. I pray for the congregation of saints. I pray for this church right now, for us all, under the, the preaching and teaching of your word this morning, under the worship and the singing that God, we will just remember what you have done for us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now.